All right, so in this video, I am going to go over the final review. Um, just as a reminder, the real final is going to be multiple choice. Um, so that'll kind of help you narrow down your answer choices when you go to take the real thing. And I believe it is just as long as this review. Yes, both the review and the final are 24 questions long. So, number one says, a circle has a radius of 16 inches. Find the length of the arc intercepted by a central angle of 60 degrees. Round your answer to two decimal places. So, whenever I have something that is asking me to find the length of an arc, I want to turn into radians. So, I am going to take that 60 degrees. And remember to convert degrees to radians, I want to multiply by pi over 180. And then to find length of an arc, it is kind of like finding circumference of a circle. So I'm finding part of a circle, that's why I turned it into radians. And then I just multiply by my radius, which is 16. So then I just want to go ahead and type this into my calculator. So I'm going to do 60 times pi divided by 180 times 16, which gives me, rounded to two decimal places, seven, nope, 16.76, and this is going to be inches. Okay, number two says a Ferris wheel has a radius of 22 feet. The wheel rotates at four revolutions per minute. Find the linear speed in feet per minute of a seat on this wheel. Round my answer to two decimal places. So this one is asking me to find linear speed. What I'm going to do here is I am going to take my revolutions, which is 4, times by 2 pi, because it's going by in a complete circle, times my radius, which here is 22. Then I just want to go ahead and type these all into the calculator. 4 times 2 pi. Oops. times 22 gets me 552.92. Mm, this is feet per minute. Number three says find the angular speed of a fan that makes 14 revolutions per minute. So for this one, I just take my speed and multiply by 2 pi. This one doesn't specify that if it wants it in decimals or not, so I'm going to leave it in pi form, which is going to give me 28 pi revolutions per minute. Okay, number four wants me to find the exact value of sine, cosine, inverse of square root of five over five. So the first thing I want to do here is I want to use this inverse trig function to draw my triangle out. Cosine is, remember, adjacent over hypotenuse. So that is going to make this side square root of five and this hypotenuse five. I want to go ahead and use the Pythagorean theorem to find this missing side length. So I currently know my C value, the hypotenuse, and one of my two sides. So I'm going to have the square root of 5 squared plus B squared equals, nope, not C squared because I actually know this value, 5 squared. So square root of 5 squared is 5 plus B squared equals 25. I'm going to go ahead and subtract 5 on both sides. I get b squared equals 20. I'm going to go ahead and take the square root of both sides. I, If I do this on a calculator, it will give me a decimal, so I want to simplify by hand. I'm going to factor tree, so I have 20, which breaks down to 4 and 5. 4 breaks down to 2 and 2. I have a pair of 2's, so this will come outside the radical and leave me with that 5 inside. So that is this side length here. Now that I know that, I want to find sine of that angle I just found. Because remember, cosine inverse is finding an angle. Sine is finding a ratio. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. This is going to give me 2 square root of 5 
over 5 for my trig value. Number five tells me that cosine is negative four-fifths and sine is greater than zero. So first thing I want to do is I want to figure out what quadrant this is in. Remember, all students take calculus. Helps me remember where they're positive. All three trig functions are positive here. Sine is positive in the second quadrant. Tangent is the only one positive in the third. And cosine is the only one positive in the fourth. So I know that cosine is negative. The only two places that cosine can be negative are in the second and third quadrants. And then it's telling me sine is greater than zero, so this means it has to be positive. Sine is positive in the first two quadrants. So the only spot I have my two overlapping quadrants in is the second quadrant. So when I go to sketch out this triangle, I want to draw it in the second quadrant. I know cosine is opposite, I mean adjacent over hypotenuse. And because I'm in the second quadrant, the x value has to be negative. So I could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out my missing side length, or I could recognize that this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Both ways are correct. So now that I know this, I want to go ahead and find my other trig functions. Cosine is already given to me. I didn't need to write that. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so 3 over 5. Also, the reason this 3 is positive is because going up is a positive thing. Then I have tangent, which is opposite over adjacent, so 3 over negative 4. I have my reciprocal function this sign, which is cosecant. That flips it. That's going to give me 5 thirds. My reciprocal to tangent flips the tangent fraction, so it's going to give me negative 4 thirds. And then my reciprocal to cosine, which is secant, which is going to give me negative 5 fourths. And I found my other five trig functions. Number 6 gives me a point on the coordinate plane, so I want to go ahead and graph this. 5, negative 12, so that's like over here. Triangles always connect diagonally to that point, and with a line connecting to the nearest x-axis. So it is 5 x units over, 12 units down. Then it wants me to find the other, or all six of the trig functions. I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the distance of the hypotenuse. I'm going to have 5 squared plus negative 12 squared equals c squared. So that's 25 plus 144 equals c squared. 169 equals c squared. I can take the square root of both sides, which gets me 13 for my hypotenuse. I want to go ahead and write out my six trig functions. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So negative 12 over 13. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so 5 over 13. And tangent is opposite over adjacent, so negative 12 over 5. I want to go ahead and get my reciprocal functions. So cosecant is the reciprocal to sine. I just flip that fraction. Secant is the reciprocal to cosine. Again, I flip that fraction. And cotangent is the reciprocal to tangent. This is going to give me 5 over negative 12. Negative signs don't matter. I can put those on the top, bottom, or out in front. Still means the same thing. Okay. Numbers 7 and 8 want me to identify the amplitude, period, key points, and phase shift if there is one. Um, amplitude is the number in front of the trig function. So my amplitude here is 1 half. My period is always the number, or 2 pi, divided by the number in front of my x value. So because I have a 2 out in front here, I'm going to divide by 2. This is going to give me pi for my period. Key points with sine, cosine, cosecant, and secant, I always take my period and divide by 4. I was writing key points. Okay. 
So this is going to give me pi divided by 4. I have no phase shift, which I want to say before I list out my key points. Phase shift would adjust my starting point for my key points. So without a phase shift, I start at 0. Then I count by this number I got. So I'm going to have 0, pi fourths, pi halves, 3 pi fourths, and pi. If I got stuck on figuring those values out, I once I had the pi fourth, I could keep adding 1 fourth on my calculator together and just putting the pi's back in when I went to write it on the review. Okay. Same thing for number 8. Amplitude, there is no number out front, but there is always an amplitude. If it's not written, it's 1. My period is, because this is a cotangent, remember, cotangent goes from 0 to pi, and tangent goes from negative pi halves to x, I mean to pi halves, normally. And then to find the period, I subtract the left value of the inequality from the right value of the inequality. But, um, so cotangent is the zero one. I, instead of x, I always plug in what's in parentheses here. So I'm going to have x plus pi halves is less than pi. And I first want to solve for x to make it zero. So I'm going to subtract pi halves on all three parts. This gets me zero is less than, nope. Negative pi halves is less than x, is less than pi halves. So then to find the period, I want to take this value and subtract this value. Which gets me a full pi. Then to find my key points, I'm going to take that pi and divide by 4. When I'm using tangent and cotangent, start at the left side of my inequality. So in this case, my starting point is going to be negative pi halves. And then I'm going to add pi force. So I have negative pi halves, negative pi force, 0, pi force, pi halves. I should end up with the right side of my inequality. If I don't, I have messed up. And I should double check either my um, subtraction to get the period or my value that I keep adding for my key points. And then this one actually does have a phase shift. Phase shifts come from being inside parentheses with the x opposite their signs. So this is going to shift pi halves left. Okay. This one wants me to verify this identity. So I have a fraction on the left and an equation or addition on the right. I also, when you got your review, you should have gotten this formula paper. Uh, these are all the same formulas you'll be getting for the final. So these are the ones you don't have to worry about memorizing. They're here for me to use. I am going to use the one, or I'm going to change the equation on the right side because I can turn tangent and tangent secant into fractions and then match my one to whatever denominator I need. So for now I'm going to leave my left side alone. Then tangent squared is the same thing as if I had my tangent ratio is sine over cosine. So I am going to square that, so I have sine squared over cosine squared. I'm going to leave the one alone for now. 
And then tangent is sine over cosine. And secant is 1 over cosine. Then I want to go ahead and if I multiply these together, it's going to give me cosine squared on the bottom. So I'm going to turn my middle term into cosine squared um, over cosine squared. So again, my left side is staying the same. I can rewrite this as one giant fraction. Okay, and then from my formula sheet, I have that sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So I can replace that with 1 for this part right here. I have 1 plus sine theta over cosine squared theta equals 1 plus sine theta over cosine theta. These match, so I have verified the identity. On the final, it is not going to ask you a verifying question. It's going to ask you a simplifying question. So it's going to try and get you to reduce something to the smallest value it can possibly be. Number 10 wants me to solve this equation on the interval. I am going to first start off by subtracting 3 on both sides. This gets me cosine squared x minus 2 cosine x minus 3 equals 0. Then I want to go ahead and factor this. This is still kind of like um, what we were doing last semester with x squared minus 2x minus 3. It is a normal quadratic that I just need to look for what multiplies to negative 3 and adds to negative 2. This is going to be negative 3 and positive 1. When I take each of those factors and I set them equal to 0, I can solve them each. I have cosine x equals 3. This is out of my range for cosine, so this one's not going to give me an answer. This one I want to go ahead and subtract 1 on both sides. This gets me cosine x equals negative 1. I want to remember that chart that is the unit circle. It's the one that goes 0, pi halves, pi, 3 pi halves. My coordinate points at these are 1 comma 0. 0 comma 1, negative 1 comma 0, and 0 negative 1. Um, also remember that a complete circle will make me at 2 pi. Cosine of an angle is always x over r. Sine of an angle is always y over r. And then tangent of an angle is always y over x. I am looking for where cosine gives me an x value of negative 1 because I am looking for my angle. The x value of negative 1 is at pi. This is the only answer in between 0 and 2 pi. Also, the square bracket means that only 0 can be part of the answer. So if it makes a complete circle and it is on this point right here, 2 pi is not an answer. So pi is my only answer on number 10. Number 11 wants me to find the exact value of sine alpha plus beta given tangent alpha equals 4 thirds. This is going to tell me that it's in the third quadrant and tangent beta is 5 twelfths and this tells me it's in the first quadrant. So I'm going to draw these triangles. This was third quadrant because remember it goes 0, pi halves, pi, and 3 pi halves. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. Because I'm in the third quadrant, both of these angles are going to be negative. This is my alpha. I know this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so I know my hypotenuse. Then I want to do the same thing for my beta triangle between 0 and pi halves. So first quadrant, opposite over adjacent. 
And this is a 5, 12, 13. It's a special right triangle. I mean, a Pythagorean triple. If I didn't know that, I could have used the Pythagorean theorem. This is my beta triangle. Then I want to look up my formula for sine alpha plus beta. It is this formula right here. So I'm going to write the right side of this equation on my paper. I'm looking for sine of alpha times cosine of beta plus cosine of alpha times sine of beta. So I just need to find these values on each triangle. Alpha is right here. Sine is going to be negative 4 over 5. When I write the fraction, I don't need to write the trig word. The trig word is just telling me what to find. Then I have cosine of beta. So this is my beta triangle. My cosine is going to be 12 over 13. Then I have cosine of alpha. So negative 3 over 5. And sine of beta is going to be 5 over 12. For now, I don't want to simplify these fractions. I just want to multiply straight across. I'm going to have negative 40... 8 over 65 minus 15 over 65. Okay, so I want to go ahead and type this into the calculator. Negative 48 over, actually, they're over the same thing, so yeah, I'll type this in the calculator. Negative 48 over 65 minus 15 over 65. I want to turn this back into a fraction. I'm going to press math, fraction, enter, which gives me negative 63 over 65 for my final answer. Okay. Number 12 tells me if cosine of my angle lies in quadrant 4, find cosine of 2 theta. So I'm going to draw this out. It is adjacent over hypotenuse. I'm going to use my Pythagorean theorem here. So I have 40 squared plus b squared equals 41 squared. 40 squared is 1600. I do not know 41 squared though. That is 1681. I want to go ahead and subtract the 1600 on both sides. This gets me b squared equals 81. Then I want to find the square root of 81, which gives me 9. And this 9 is going to be negative because it's going down. Then I want to find cosine of 2 theta. This is a double angle, so I want to look for the double angle formula. 2 theta is right here. So I'm plugging into the right side of this equation, which is cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Then I just find these values from this. Cosine is 40 over 41. It needs to get squared. Minus sine theta, which is negative 9 over 41 squared. So I have 1,600 over 1,681 minus the negative 9 getting squared is going to turn into a positive 81 over 1,681. I am going to type this part into my calculator. Move this out of the light. 1,600 divided by 1,681 minus 81 divided by 1,681. Turn this back into a fraction. Gets me 15, 19 over 16, 81. And that is my final answer here. Number 13 wants me to solve the triangle, round the lengths to the nearest tenth, and the angle to the nearest degree. So I'm going to start off by drawing this out. My side length for A is 12, my side length for B is 16.1, and my degree for A is 37. This one goes in order of side side angle. So this is going to be a law of sines. Law of sines are these ones right here. 
I set up a proportion between two of the three equations and solve for my missing value. So I am going to, I have a pair of matching side and angle for A. So I'm gonna have 12 sine of 37. I have a side length for B, so I can go ahead and solve for the angle for B. 16.1 over sine of B. I wanna get that trig function out of the denominator, so I'm gonna multiply both sides by sine of B. Then I want to get rid of that fraction from the left side and move it over. So I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal. I'm going to just rewrite this. Then I want to find my inverse sine to isolate my angle. This is going to round to 54 degrees because it's an angle. Because this is acute and my very first angle was acute, I need to check to make sure I don't have two triangles. I only have to check when I have side side angle. So the way I check is I'm going to do 180 minus 54, which gives me 126. If it works, this is going to be my new angle. I'm going to take that 126 and add it to the original angle, which was 37, which gives me 163, which is less than 180. This means there are two triangles. So I have B1 equals 54 degrees. Then I continue solving the first triangle with the original angle. I apologize for not giving us enough room here. Uh, I can get my C angle by doing 180 minus the 37 minus the 54. Which gets us 89 degrees. Oh, and this is going to be C1, by the way. Then I want to use this degree value to find the side length. So I'm going to have 12 sine of 37 equals little c1 sine of 89. If I move this over, I'm going to have, to isolate this, I'm going to multiply both sides by sine of 89. I get 12 sine of 89 over sine of 37 equals c1. For the side length. I'm going to go ahead and type this into the calculator. Which this is a side length so it's one decimal place 19.9. Then I want to go ahead and do the same thing for my second triangle. B2 is this value I found in green the 126. So now I need to find C2 which is going to be 180. The stuff I wrote in blue is the same for both triangles. So these are going to be the same for my second triangle. I'm going to subtract my original angle of 37 and this new B value of 126. Which gets me 17. Then I want to use that 17 to find the missing side length like I did with my C1. So I'm going to still have the 12 over sine of 37 equals C2 over sine of 17. I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by sine of 17. Which 
This is going to give me C2 equals 12 sine of 17 over sine of 37. And then I just want to go ahead and type that into the calculator. Which gives me 5.8. Okay, so I'm going to write the 5.8 right here. And I have found all six pieces of my triangle. So remember when it's a side-side angle triangle and my angle given to me is acute, and the very first angle I get is also acute, I need to check to make sure there isn't, or if there is two triangles. Sometimes there will only be one. Uh, and sometimes if this part gives me an error, that means there are no triangles. So moving on, number 14 wants me to solve the triangle and it wants me to round the lengths to the nearest tenth and the angle me measures to the nearest degree. So same thing as last time. I'm gonna draw out my triangle. My side length for A is 9.3, my side length for B is 41, and my angle for A is 18. Again, the reason I draw out these triangles is so I can see what kind of triangle it is. Um, depending on what kind of triangles they are, from the information I'm given, side side angle, um, angle side angle, angle angle side will be law of sines. Side 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 or side angle side will be... Um, law of cosines. So this one I have a side in, oh I wanted to say what this was. This one is side side angle. So again this is the one where I might need to check for that uh, second triangle. I just want to first start off by setting it up. I have my side length for A over sine of 18 equals my side length for B over sine of B. I'm going to go ahead and try and solve for my angle for B. I'm going to multiply both sides by sine of B. This is going to give me sine of B times 9.3 over sine of 18, which should equal 41. Then I want to get rid of that fraction, so I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal on both sides. I'm going to rewrite this down below. Then I want to find inverse sine on both sides to isolate my angle. Remember, inverse sine will always give me angle measures. Regular sine will give me ratio lengths. Okay, and then I want to go ahead and type this into my calculator. So I have inverse sine, 41, sine of 18, divided by 9.3. In this specific situation, the calculator is giving me an error. Because this is a side-side angle triangle, an error is okay. All that this means is that there is no triangle here. Moving on to my next one, it again wants me to solve a triangle and round my lengths to the nearest degree and my angles to, the, oh, my lengths to the nearest tenth and my angles to the nearest degree. So I'm going to start off by drawing out my triangle. I have my side length A of 3, my side length B of 9, and my side length C of 8. If I look at my formulas again, I have law of cosines. I have two different ones. This first one is good for finding angles, I mean finding side lengths. And the second one is good for finding angles. This first one will always work no matter what. This one requires a lot more manipulation to work with and it will take a lot longer but will also work as well for either one. But they're set up easily for the two things I'm looking for. So I'm going to use the finding angles one. The way I decide which angle to use or solve for is with side, side, side. I want to look for my largest side, which here is 9. 
So I'm going to have cosine b, and then I'm going to plug in. So that is a squared plus c squared minus that b squared divided by 2 times a times c. I could type this part into the calculator. I'm just going to leave it alone for now. I'm actually going to isolate my variable by taking the inverse cosine of both sides. So this is going to give me inverse cosine of 3 squared plus 8 squared minus 9 squared over 2 times 3 times 8. And if I'm going to type this into my calculator, I'm going to make sure my numerator is in a set of parentheses and my denominator is in a separate set of parentheses. So let me, so I'm going to go cosine inverse and then parentheses 3 squared plus 8 squared minus 9 squared. Close off that set of parentheses for my numerator. Then divide parentheses 2 times 3 times 8, which gives me, this is an angle, so it's going to give me 100. Then I want to do law of sines. I want, um, because I found I'm doing side, 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 it doesn't matter which angle I find next. I'm just going to go find A because it comes next alphabetically. So I have my side length for C, which is 8, over my sine of 100, equals my A side length of 3, over sine of my angle A. I am going to isolate, or not isolate, get that trig function out of the denominator by multiplying both sides by sine of A. Then I want to go ahead and get rid of this fraction by multiplying the reciprocal. Okay, then I want to go ahead and isolate my variable fi by finding the inverse sine of both sides. So if I type this in, I'm going to do sine inverse of 3 sine 100 divided by 8, which this is going to round to 22 degrees. Then I want to go ahead and find my B. Because I have two of my three angles, I can subtract from 180, which when I type in my calculator gets me 58 degrees. Okay. Number 16 wants me to write the complex number in standard form. This one is using De Moivre theorem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my exponent, I'm going to take my number out front and raise it to the exponent. Then I'm going to have cosine that number from my exponent is going to go in front of both of these angles. So 3 pi fourths plus i times sine of 3 pi fourths. Then I want to evaluate 3 cubed is 27. Cosine of 3 pi fourths, this is in the second quadrant. And the way I find my reference angle right here is in, I'm going to take pi minus my angle. So I'm going to do pi minus 3 pi fourths, which gives me a reference angle of pi fourths. So cosine of pi fourths, remember from that chart that I asked you guys to memorize at the beginning of the year. I will draw this out again. It goes pi six, pi fourths pi thirds, then it goes sine, cosine, 
tangent. My numbers for sine go 1, 2, 3, and they are all over 2. My numerators are square rooted. I don't have to square root 1 because the square root of 1 is 1. Cosine counts backwards. It's going to go 3, 2, 1. Again, all over 2. And again, square rooting my numerators. Tangent, I take sine and divide by cosine. So I'm going to have 1 half divided by the square root of 3 over 2. This is going to give me, I'll write this down here. If I flip my bottom fraction, it is 1 half times 2 over the square root of 3. The 2's will cancel out. It gives me 1 over the square root of 3, which I can rationalize to just be square root of 3 over 3. Square root of 2 over 2 divided by the square root of 2 over 2 gives me 1. Over here, I have square root of 3 over 2 divided by 1 half. So I will do the work down here. <laughs> Those 2's cancel out, and I'm just left with the square root of 3. So anyways, you will need to memorize this again for the final, if you haven't already. Pi force cosine is square root of 2 over 2. But because I am in the second quadrant, remember all students take calculus, cosine is negative here. So the square root of 2 is square root of 2 over 2 is negative. On the next one, I still have that i out front. And then this is going to be square root of 2 over 2. I want to go ahead and multiply. This is negative 27 square root of 2 over 2 plus i square root of 2. Nope, where's that 27? I'm actually going to move the i to the end too. 27 square root of 2 over 2 i. Okay, 17 wants me to solve using substitution. This is uh, isolating a variable and then plugging in for it. I'm going to start off by subtracting 7x from both sides from my first equation because the y has no coefficient out front. This gives me y equals negative 7x minus 25. I'm going to go ahead and plug this in for my y in the second equation. This is going to give me 2x minus 5 times negative 7x minus 25 should equal 14. On this, I am going to distribute. I have 2x plus 35x. Negative 5 times negative 25 is positive 125 equals 14. Combine like terms. I have 37x plus 125 equals 14. I want to subtract 125 from both sides. This gives me 37x equals negative 111. I want to go ahead and divide both sides by 37, which gives me negative 3. I'm going to go ahead and plug in. I have 7 times negative 3 plus y equals 25. So negative 21 plus y equals 25. I want to go ahead and add 21 to both sides. I get y equals 46. Just kidding. It equaled negative 25. So I have negative 25 plus 21, which should give me negative 4. So my final answer here is negative 3, negative 4. Remember, you always write your answers in alphabetical order, x, y, z, if there is a z. My next question wants me to solve using elimination. This is where I want my coefficients to cancel out. This first one has fractions. 
So I'm going to multiply by negative 6 to get rid of those fractions and to turn this y value into a negative 1, so it will cancel out with the y in the second equation. Negative 6 times 2 thirds gives me negative 4x. Negative 6 times 1 6 y gives me negative y. And negative 6 times 2 thirds gives me negative 4. If I add these two equations down, the 4x's cancel out, the y's cancel out, and the 4's cancel out, so I have 0 equals 0. This is in a situation where the two lines overlap and I will have infinitely many solutions. I need to define one of my variables to be x, I mean a, and I'm going to choose x. Then I'm going to solve, so I have 4a plus y equals 4. If I subtract 4a on both sides, I get y equals negative 4a plus 4. This gives me an answer of a comma negative 4a plus 4. This could be a solution, or if I did it the other way around, I could have done y equaling a. So I could have had 4x plus a equals 4, subtracted my a over, 4x equals 4 minus a, divide everything by 4, x equals 1 minus a over 4. So as a coordinate point, I would have this. Either one of those answers is correct on the test. Um, when, if there is, on the final, if there is an equation with infinitely many solutions, there will only be one correct answer for the infinitely many solutions. So there will only be one answer with the A's. But the answer with the A's might not mean that it is infinitely many. You have to solve it out. Number 19 tells me I can solve using any method. I am going to choose to solve this by using matrices on my calculator. So that is the one where I write the augmented matrix. I have 1, 1, negative 2, negative 1. What I did was I took all of my coefficients from my top equation and wrote them and I set it. the number that it is set equal to is also part of this. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the second equation. So each equation is a row in the matrix. So then I'm going to go ahead and type this in. Uh, this is a 3 by 4, so I need to change the size that my calculator has. Type in these values. I'm going to go second matrix, arrow over to, not edit, math. Then I want to go down to choice B, which is RREF. Select that. Then go back to second matrix. Press my choice for A. Plug that in. It gives me this matrix. So because if I look at the square part of the matrix, so the first three columns, it gives me a nice diagonal row of ones with zeros everywhere else. This means I have a solution, and these are already in alphabetical order. So my answer here is 0, 3, 2. This is my answer. You can use this method of matrices to solve systems of equations on the final. In fact, you can use it for any question that asks you to solve a matrix, unless it is the one that has infinitely many, because I don't re require a, special, a specific method, because I can't check your method. It's multiple choice. Number 20 says I can solve using any method. I am personally going to solve this one by hand because of the x equals 2. I'm going to take this and just plug it into that equation up above. I have 4 times 2 minus y equals 3, which gives me 8. I want to go ahead and subtract 8 on both sides. I have negative y equals negative 5. I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by negative 1, which gives me y equals 5. Then I want to go ahead and plug in the y and x into my top equation. So I have 2 plus 5 plus 2z equals negative 1. 
then I want to go ahead and combine like terms on the left side. I have 7 plus 2z equals negative 1. I want to subtract 7 from both sides. I get 2z equals negative 8. I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by 2. This gets me z equals negative 4. I'm going to go ahead and write out my answer. I have 2, 5, negative 4 because it goes x, y, z. And that is my coordinate point for this answer. Okay, this one wants me to write the augmented matrix and then give the dimensions of the system. So this is the one where I'm just writing the part that I would type into the calculator and I'm not actually going ahead and doing it. It has no y term, so I'm going to write that right there so I don't forget when I go to write this out. My first row is 1, 2, negative 1, 1. My second row is 1, 0, 1, 3. My third row is 2, negative 1, 1, 3. So this is my augmented matrix. And then the size of this matrix is the number of rows. So I have three rows by four columns. Number 22 wants me to perform the matrix operations. It's just adding. So I'm going to add the same row, same column together. So I have 4 plus 1 for my first row, first column. 3 plus 6 for my first, oops, 3 minus 6 actually. For my first row, second column. 10 plus 0 for my first row, third column. Negative 9 plus 5 for my second row, first column. 3 minus 2 for my second row, second column. And 2 plus 1 for my second row, third column. Then I just want to go ahead and combine those. 4 plus 1 is 5. 3 minus 6 is negative 3. 10 plus 0 is 10. Negative 9 plus 5 is negative 4. 3 minus 2 is 1. And 2 plus 1 is 3. So this is my matrix after I've added. On number 23, I have a scalar out front. So I'm just going to multiply each of my terms by that 3. So I have 7 times 3, 8 times 3, negative 3 times 3, 0 times 3, 1 times 3, negative 2 times 3. And I just go ahead and actually multiply those out. I have 21, 24, negative 9, 0, 3, negative 6. My final question is to do matrix multiplication. I am multiplying rows across with columns down. Uh, these need to be the same. So this first one is a 2 by 2, and this one is a 2 by 3. The numbers in the middle need to be the same. Otherwise, I can't multiply it and it'd be undefined. I have the same middle number, so I can go ahead and multiply it out. I'm going to take this first row and multiply by the second or first column. So I'm going to have 2 times 1 plus 6 times 6. Then I have 2 times negative 4 plus 6 times negative 7. Then I have 2 times 3 plus 6 times 2. When I match up each of my rows to each of my columns, I take the first number for, for for both of them and multiply them together and add it to the second number multiplied together. Then I'm going to do my second row times my first column. This is going to give me negative 2 times 1 plus 0 times 6. Negative 2 times negative 4 plus 0 times negative 7. Negative 2, negative 2 times 3 plus 0 times 2. I'm going to go ahead and actually solve out that multiplication. So for the first one I have 2 plus 36, negative 8 minus 42, 6 plus 12, negative 2 plus 0, 8 plus 0, negative 6 plus 0. Then I want to combine my terms. I'm going to have 38, negative 50, 18, negative 2, 8, and negative 6 for my matrix.